You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, CEO of BioHealth Innovation, located in Rockville, Maryland, in the BioHealth Capital Region, and I'm also your host for BioTalk. And we have a different flavor of BioTalk today for our listeners. We're basically talking with an international company that is from Israel, but also has a presence in the United States. And really, we're going to find out from its CEO, Seth Salpeter who is the co-founder and CEO of Immunex, Israeli-based company, about how he started the company in Israel and what are the advantages of coming to the United States other than the obvious, which is that it's a much larger market than Israel. But I'd like to welcome Seth to Biotalk. Seth, welcome to Biotalk. Hi, Rich. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to catch up with you again and hear about the progress you're making with the company. And Traditionally, what we do, Seth, is rather than me trying to read your resume, we like to have the entrepreneurs introduce themselves with those things that would be relevant to our listeners about how you got started in this world and how you evolved where you are today. So why don't you give us a little bit of your background? Sure. So we're talking about me starting an Israeli company, but actually I'm originally from New York City. So I was born and raised on the Upper West Side of New York. And after I finished my undergraduate studies in biology, I moved to Israel. I was about 22, 23. And I did my PhD in biochemistry at the Hebrew University, after which uh, I did postdoctoral studies as a postdoctoral fellow, as well in organic chemistry. And then as I was wrapping up my academic studies, I decided to transfer over to industry. I thought that that was a little bit of a better position for me. And I joined a company called Site Diagnostics, where I was chief scientific officer and head of business development. And then after that, founded a company called QResponse, or a CTO. And then a little while ago, about a year and a half, two years ago, we founded Immunix, which is a spinoff from the Hebrew University based in Jerusalem. And then since the founding, I've been CEO of Immunix. And then very recently, maybe about six, six to nine months ago, We started moving the center of gravity of the company over to the U.S. So we now have office and laboratory space in New York City. And slowly but surely, we're rebalancing the source of power in the company to be a a two international kind of a base. That's very interesting background. And in the U.S., a lot of the people we talk to that are spin outs out of universities talk a little bit about the tech transfer process in those unique environments, because sometimes it's not the easiest environment to work from. So talk a little bit about your experience with the tech transfer offices at Hebrew University and if you've learned anything differently versus what goes on in America versus an Israeli university. Yeah, so I've spun off two companies from university, one from the Weizmann Institute, which is a very well-established research institute here in Israel. It's one of the world's top research institutes. And then more recently from the Hebrew University. You know, I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, so tech transfer sort of originates in Israel. I think the Weizmann uh, Yeda was one of the first tech transfer organizations in the world. In the 60s, they started. So tech transfer is pretty well established in Israel and, it, and it's pretty well developed. You know, I know that there are challenges with tech transfer everywhere in the world. And I think it's kind of evolving. I know that when I was a PhD student, it was less well accepted that there were so many spinoffs. I think now there's become kind of a closer bridge between academia and industry, whereby tech transfer in general is becoming more active and the expectations of them are becoming, I would say, higher or, you know, the standards are more accepted. So I I think it's evolving in the right direction everywhere in the world. I think Israel is pretty much on par with what's going on in the U.S. And of course, you know, depending on who the people you're working with by chance or or which institute, obviously it varies. But I think that overall, the process works. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than you would want it to. Usually when you're starting something, you're in a big rush and they have hundreds of labs or researchers that they're working with and it takes a long time. So I think that the take home is usually that if you're patient and polite and thoughtful, it works out. But, you know, everywhere in the world, it just takes longer than people would want. So that's frustrating. 
Yeah, I, I think everybody shares that same frustration, Seth. You're not alone. So I guess let's talk just real briefly before we leave the university. In the U.S., there's somewhat of a migration now. Everybody used to do royalty and license agreements, and now they're doing some equity with the spin outs. What's the trend in Israel? Is it more royalty and license based, or is it a combination with equity involved with the spin outs as well? Yeah, so now I think this is true everywhere. Everybody wants some of everything. And, you know, the universities at the end of the day, they have all the leverage. If they don't say go, then it doesn't go, right? I mean, that said, they, you know, know they're dealing with established people. So I think that, yes, in Israel as well, it's brought into including equity in the packages. Now the models are becoming more hybrid, right? So like what it is, is a lot of these TTOs, they have like in their bylaws that there's certain defined rules for all the researchers that date back 30 or 40 years. And, you know, to change those up and to meet modern kind of expectations has not always really developed. But I think that across the board, the TTOs now want royalties, milestones and equity. So that's become just built in to some degree, whether we like it or not. Yeah, basically, I think that's historically what we're seeing as well. And those that are really entrepreneurially driven will generally be more flexible as the companies are trying to work with strategic partners and investors those that are a little more control oriented sometimes make it more difficult for the entrepreneurs to get some deals done. I think one of the things that is a big deal in the US that is lagging here in, the, in Israel is that a lot of the universities now are more proactive about offering funding and the spin off. So they have their own funds and then they also have networks of angels or, or graduates who, who can be helpful. So I think. I wouldn't underestimate that, right? So if, if they're going to come in, they do it here. We do have TTO support research. They give research grants and they do. There are some that have their own funds, but I think they're the large universities are now understanding that that's in their interest because they can make a lot of money off of good investments. So that's one step that I think is really a novelty over maybe the last five or 10 years that is very, very helpful because to get the seed funding as hard as, you know, I think to some degree, each round has its own challenging, but, but seed funding is very, very hard. So if the university will help you out with that, that's huge. Super. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the company now. You're a postdoc, PhD, interested to know whether or not you actually did any research in the technology that you spun out to create Immunex. If not, how you got involved with the science and the technology and the researchers who were involved as you were forming the company. Uh, give us a little history, how it evolved, how the name evolved, and sort of all of those things that people would be interested in. Right. So yeah, the stories are fun. So actually, it's an interesting story. So one of the academic founders, uh, Tzvika Granod, so when he did his first postdoc before he went to the States to do a fellowship at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, he was a postdoc and I was a PhD student. So I walked into the lab on my first day. You know, I just moved to Israel more or less. And he was there. And so he was one of the first people I met in science. And then, you know, we became good friends and he moved to New York City. And of course, I was you know always in New York City because my family is from there and we stayed in touch. And then he came back to Hebrew U maybe five or six years later. And we stayed in touch and I followed his research. And we actually, I puttered around at a, at a few points trying to come up with a way that we could start a company because I always thought that neutrophils were super interesting and a tremendously underserved area of immune modulation. And this is Svika's area of, of expertise. And I thought that if we could put our heads together, you know, maybe we could come up with something. And it turned out that I tried for a little while, kind of in my spare time in garage mode, and, and we couldn't get it couldn't get anything interesting. But then he spent five years developing the technology in his lab together with another co-founder, Tzvi Freelander, who's also a big expert in neutrophils. And it really required a tremendous amount of time and effort, right, to get the basic technology off the ground. And this was really, you know, the U.S. has government supporting grants, obviously the NIH grants, but Israel also has some, I would say, academic industry bridging grants that supported their work for five or six years. And then once the technology was significantly developed and, and some investors had actually already come into the picture with an interest to spin it off. So then I picked up on it again, something that you know I had looked into maybe six or seven years prior with an idea that maybe it'll work out. And then it had. So that was a very convenient time to come in. Actually, for myself, the investors were already in the picture. So that really spared a lot of heartache because we didn't have to go out and try and raise 
So I came in at a very convenient time, I would say. I was not involved in the early development of the technology, but I was always familiar with the concepts and the idea and the development. My postdoc was in immunology. You know, we were applying organic chemistry molecules, peptides to immunological development. So, you know, I was familiar with a lot of the work that was being done and I understood it from a, a technology basis. So it was a good fit. I'd been in, you know, involved in it for a long time and I understood it. And of course, you know, I had background in the business side of it and the startup side of it. I think that that's really important. Basically, then when you got involved, the licensing from the university had already occurred, I would assume. I'm just making an assumption here. And then also the company had already been named at that point, And you got involved when they really needed it to sort of take it to the next level, when they needed a CEO that was a little more business oriented than rather than scientific oriented. So not exactly. I did miss out on a lot of heartache. <laughs> I mean, I found some more in other places, so it's okay. So I came in when about 75% of the license negotiations were done. There was still what to be done when I came in. And, you know, in terms of completing the license and, and getting it squared away, you know, the actual basic nuts and bolts of getting the company set up. I had seen it before. I'd done it before. So it wasn't weird to me. It wasn't unusual. It, it didn't go so poorly. It was okay. I was involved in naming the company. So that was a process that I led. It was the third company that I was involved in naming. So I had some experience managing the process or being involved in the process. It wasn't so bad. I mean, it was not so great, but I think Immunix is, is, is a good name. And I think what's important is that everybody, all the important players feel that their opinion is heard, right? That it shouldn't be that somebody's coming in and forcing something and that you mostly try and avoid the really bad names. You know, I don't think any name is so amazingly awesome from any company that I've heard. So basically you want to make sure that everybody feels like they're part of the process and that nobody gets a really bad name in there, which can happen in Israel because people here, they're not native English speakers. And a lot of the, the double meanings, they don't necessarily get. So I was lucky they deferred to me a little bit more because I'm American. Yeah, great. Well, they got the best of both sides of the pond then, didn't they? So let's talk a little bit about the core science and sort of the target market for the science that Immunix has? Sure. So the idea is basically, you know, today there are hundreds of billions of dollars worth of drug development that's targeted at the immune system. And a lot of work there is being done around, you know, T-cells, which have proven to be very important in immunotherapies like in cancer, and then also cytokine suppression, like for various autoimmune diseases. You know, everybody has been talking recently about Humira because it's gone off patent. So one of the cells that's not affected by a lot of these modalities is the neutrophil, which is also the most dominant immune cell in the immune system. So the neutrophil makes up about 70% of the immune system and is really the first line responder. And it's also a very powerful cell. So it has a lot of mechanisms which it uses to defend against you know, pathogens. But of course, the immune system can become deregulated, including the neutrophil. And the neutrophils have been recognized to be very involved in a lot of diseases, but there aren't any FDA approved drugs that specifically modulate their activity. So many drug companies over the last 10 years, 20 years even, have been trying to develop these types of molecules, but they've failed. And they failed for a variety of reasons. Some of it having to do with the fact that if you deplete neutrophils, you end up with something called neutropenia, which is you know a lack of neutrophils in the body, and that can be fatal. Some of it is because there's so many neutrophils and they're very hard to get to, and they're very hard to dose. So some of it is that it's very hard to also modulate a neutrophil because they have a lot of different activities that are triggered once they're activated. It's not just one particular activity. So there are a variety of challenges involved with the neutrophils. And so Munix licensed a specific technology from the university and has been involved in developing its own technologies to specifically modulate neutrophils and toxic neutrophils and overcome a lot of these challenges in different ways. So we've developed a few technologies in addition to the original, we call TENS, which is targeted neutrophil nanoparticles. These are nanoparticles that specifically concentrate drugs in neutrophils and avoid systemic toxicity. And we've developed some of our own molecules and identified some FDA-approved of patent molecules. So we've developed a pretty significant IP portfolio in a pretty short amount of time to be able to overcome these hurdles. And now we're applying these technologies in a variety of different indications where we think that there's a lot of potential. So IBD is one area that we're super interested in. And there are some very interesting dermatological indications where neutrophils play a huge role and there's a significant unmet need. 
So basically, we're looking at inflammatory conditions where neutrophils are, are very involved and there's a huge unmet need in the market. And we think that we can come in and use our technologies to really improve human health for these populations that are still underserved and, and suffering. And with IBD being one of the targets, I would imagine you did a lot of intellectual property research in order to protect your technology. So where do you stand with your IP and talk about Israeli IP, PCT, American, and how far have you gone with your protection? Yeah, so we've submitted three patent applications. First, the earliest one on the targeting technology is national phase, and the other two are now in PCT. So the patent system for like all the weird stuff about it, it's pretty well integrated internationally. So it doesn't really matter where you're filing the provisionals. The PCTs, I've generally liked to file in Europe. I find that you get good reviews there. There are some countries where you get reviews back and it's just nonsense. So I think I have filed PCTs in the US, but generally we do them in Europe. And then when you go to national phase, so I think it's becoming more and more trendy to do the accelerated, the fast track patents in, in the US. So we've fast tracked our national phase in the US. I think that that's a really good approach to it. I've been involved in patent applications that can take five or six years, and it's just crazy. You know, you're telling your investors for five or six years, we're working on it. So yeah, I mean, you know, I guess there's that the emoji when you put up your hands, right? So, but I think that is a troubling element of the patent system. It takes so long. And I think that the fast track in the US is a really great way to overcome that. So it's well integrated internationally. We have great patent attorneys in Israel. Sometimes I've had the experience that I felt we needed to use somebody and the U.S. for U.S. prosecution, but it, it's pretty good across the board. Talk a little bit about your clinical strategy too, Seth. So the clinical strategy, you know, we're very early stage, but that said, even at the early stage, you have to be very mindful of what your end game is, right? So, you know, whatever you're doing, you have to plan ultimately to get into a person and, and you to get into a person, you have to prove in some type of organized experiment that it has to be there. So we've been mindful from the beginning that this is the end game. We haven't been one of these companies that's, you know, completely platform development, whatever comes out, we'll figure out how it works. So we've worked for every discipline that we've looked at, for every indication we've looked at, we've brought on at least one or two, you know, physicians, preferably KOLs, who can really like look at what we're doing and say, okay, does this make sense or not? And assuming that it makes sense, how would we start looking at it in a clinical study? So I think that our, you know, go to clinic strategy is to, you know, we have a platform and we have these molecules. So to kind of weed it down to really one lead compound, and then try and take a phase 1A, 1B situation where you do like a single ascending dose and a multiple ascending dose, hopefully getting it to patients as quickly as possible. We want to see that it's working with some as as quickly as possible in the patient population. So we think that that's doable, you know, to start off in healthy patients, but again, to transfer over as quickly as we can to set up some endpoints that will show some type of initial efficacy of the therapy. I think you've talked about something that's very important to a lot of international entrepreneurs when they want to try to come to the U.S. market. They underestimate the need and the value of key opinion leaders in the KOLs. And I think it's something you got to get right out from the get-go. When you're starting out, you have to identify those influencers and those people who are most knowledgeable in your areas where your science really is focused. And so I, I'm glad that you have done that right from the beginning before you really get into the the heavy clinical nature of what you're doing in the future. And I think that you also understand, and you're very fortunate to have sort of the environment around you in New York City and sort of the East Coast, where you can identify some of the strongest people in the United States. Yeah, I definitely think that that's huge. And that's, I think Ethel was pointing this out to me in her experience, sometimes, you know, international companies miss the boat. Look, there's a lot of difficulty crossing whatever the border is. And I think that the KOLs are super important in the U.S., as you said. You really can't do anything without them. And I think part of it was, again, I, I came in when we started the company. I explained to everybody very early on that we're going to the U.S. and everything that we you know, are doing has, you know, somebody would say, oh, I know a KOL in Germany. I was like, no, no, no. Germany is a great place. Tell me somebody in the U.S. It can be California. It can be Boston. It can be wherever. So that was something that I just came in in a very dogmatic way. And it's, again, I have a luxury because I'm from the U.S. and that made it a lot easier. But I think that the earlier that you get a lot of this into the DNA of the company, 
It's great to start the company wherever you are. It's great to do innovation there, but the scaling of the company to ultimately scale, you have to be in a major market. And to be in the major market, you have to start planning for that from really early on to get it going because it's something that has to be, you know, really built into the DNA of the company. Yeah. And you mentioned Ethel. I'm going to get to Ethel Rubin in a, in a second, who's one of the entrepreneurs in residence at the National Institute of Health and Biohealth Innovation. But before I go there, I just want to close on sort of the ecosystem that you had in or that you actually have in Israel. And you also talked a little bit about the ecosystem and the differences in the United States. But, you know, I think there's a very strong support for early stage entrepreneurs within Israel. And you might talk a little bit about that. And sort of in the prior days, it used to be the chief scientist office in Israel. And I know the change departments and terminology around how that is structured within the Israeli government. But the Israeli government does provide some very strong support for startups within Israel. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So it used to be called the chief scientist. And I think they maybe like, I don't even know when, maybe five to 10 years ago, they rebranded it and they call themselves the Israel Innovation Authority now. So this is basically a branch of the government that helps develop technology and commercialize technology on a variety of different levels, you know, obviously spinning out from academia, but mature companies are, are assisted as well. So it's basically, it's not a grant. They provide funding, which they expect you to return. And, you know, historically, so this is a boon, obviously, for the, you know, the startup ecosystem here because it would be impossible for 90% of these companies to raise capital from seed investors. And the government really allows this ecosystem to thrive. I think it's challenging. There's similarities to what goes on with like SBIR. Anybody who's done an SBIR grant knows that those are really hard just to formulate and to get out and to manage. And it's not easy. The EU also has a grant system. It's called the EIC. All of these government grants are really hard, but they enable the system to function. So I think that the Israeli program is, is very good in helping companies get started and helping companies grow. There are certain, I would say, issues with it, right? So they want you to try and keep the funding or the companies as much as you can in Israel, which can be perceived as a headwind from foreign investors. And people have had issues with that in the past. But I think there has been some improvement here in terms of how those processes are managed. And I think that the entrepreneurs have to be a little bit smarter about it. I mean, you can't take funding from them endlessly with the understanding that, you know, your exit strategy is to go abroad, right? So you have to be able to balance that. And I think that's another thing that you really need to be conscious of when you start, you know, like how the funding plan is going to play itself out. You've been fortunate, though, to be able to get that support because everybody doesn't isn't successful in getting that startup funding from the Israeli government. And we've talked about that in the past, but that also is a stamp of approval or credibility for you when you come to America, because I understand the scrutiny you have to go through to get that funding. And I would imagine just like getting federal funding in the United States, getting the government funding in Israel is better than coming in cold without having that support from the Israeli government. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I think that the bar is so high today when people are looking to fund you. You have to have everything, right? So, like, I speak to these investors and they tell me, like, they see four or 500 companies a year and they invest in three or four. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, the things that really matter are the fundamental technology, the data, right? Having strong data, you know, having good KOLs, as you said, who stand behind the story, if you have credible investors already or you have a track record, but I don't think that that gives you any special advantage. I think it's really an amazing program that enables a lot of technology development. But I mean, but we have a bunch of things already at Immunix that we've done and I tell it to people and they're like, meh. So what, right? Thank you. <laughs> what have I you saw done nine for companies me? like that last week. <laughs> what have you done for me lately, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned Ethel Rubin and Ethel is one of the entrepreneurs in residence that's the lead at the National Institute of Health where we had a 10-year program with them. I guess you came in contact with Ethel at NYU and you might talk a little bit about what you were engaged with at NYU and how you came in contact with Ethel and so how it evolved to where it's sort of your relationship is today. Sure. So that goes back again to what I was telling everybody in the beginning about how we have to move the center of gravity to the US. And we encountered very early on this program called EFL, Endless, Endless Frontier Labs, if I'm not mistaken. 
And it's a really great program that's run by NYU Business School that has a few different disciplines. One of them is biotechnology, and they host companies from all over the world in this accelerator. And it's really a mentoring program. So I think that there are like five or six meetings and you have to come to all of them. And they give you mentors in each meeting to help you develop your pitch and and basically make connections. And it's one of these, you get voted off the island sometimes, very rarely, but the mentors choose you at the end of each session when you're not there. So I met a lot of really interesting people, cool people, very helpful at early stages in the program. And one of them was Ethel, who was very helpful, obviously, in terms of developing our stories. So, you know, that's a big challenge for early stage companies, how to present themselves and and what, you know, the key points that they want to be making to everybody who's listening. And then, you know, she introduced me to BHI, right? So that was, I think, a point in time where very, very early on, like I think the company, we were in EFL maybe six months after we launched and we were still, you know, I was still trying to figure out the best way to start positioning the company actually in the US. And I think that was something that was helpful to try and start thinking, okay, you know, where are we going to open the company? Why are we going to open the company? I mean, it was kind of a mantra of mine that we're going to shift the center of gravity to the US, but at the same time, you know, you have to have some real logic to do it. You can't just do it because at some point it's going to be important. So I think that that was a really important step in terms of building the bridge, trying to, you know, identify the strategy, how we were going to do it and why and with who. So that's, I think, where Ethel was super helpful. Yeah, and we're glad that she introduced you to us. And, you know, one of the benefits of working with you is you already had the understanding about sort of the American ecosystem, being an American, living in New York City versus being cold, coming in internationally and just learning all about the culture at the same time you're trying to get your company launched. So one of the things Ethel did is put you in front of sort of, a, we have an EIR day once a month. You got a chance to present your business to a number of different entrepreneurs and residents, got instantaneous feedback. And I think one of the people that was on that call was Steve Wolpe, another one of the EIRs at NIH. And you had made a decision and learned about, and you already knew, but you learned more about the SVIR program at NIH and decided that based on being an American controlled company in the US with Immunex and you leading that, you were eligible to go after an SVIR application. So talk a little bit about that decision to go after the SVIR and how you found that process, sometimes frustrating at times, I think, to get lined up to be eligible and also what it took to really get a quality proposal submitted to the NIH. So obviously the SBIR is is a great program. I mean, very much like the Israel Innovation Authority. And I think at early stages, you have to be able to get capital from non-dilutive sources or else you won't survive, right? Whatever your seed funding is, it's never enough. And the serious investors want a lot more. And any non-dilutive funding opportunities, you have to be very aggressive about. So SBIR was something that I had, had my eye on Always. I mean, even, you know, in previous startups, but it just never really worked out. So that said, I've applied for the SBIR. I've not yet received an SBIR. So I don't want to talk too confidently about the process. Hopefully I'll come back on in in six months and, and I'll tell you how great it was to get it. So I think it's a great program. Obviously, all American entrepreneurs take advantage of it. And for international companies, so it's more challenging, obviously. And I know BHI, I, I am have a more of an understanding about it. And being an American citizen, it was, I think, easier. That said, the process was very challenging. There were a lot of steps in the process that are not so simple to coordinate. And, you know, so it, it could have gone smoothly. I made a few small mistakes here and there, which turned out to be very painful to fix in terms of the registration process. So funny story, because we like stories on podcasts. So when I registered the company with SAM was the government registration. So I didn't realize that our company in America was called Immunix Pharma USA Inc., right? And I had registered it as Immunix Pharma USA. And then after like one of these huge, like long processes to like a month or two, I got back a letter from the Department of Defense or the cage system that my company doesn't actually exist in Delaware. So I looked at it very closely and I saw that it's because I hadn't written ink in the system and a computer matches you with the registry in Delaware. And it took me four months to fix that. And I'm not, (laughs) it's not like I wrote an email and I had to call them three times a week for four months. They had some glitch in the computer system. It was really painful and that can happen. 
So I would say that anybody who's interested in it, it's an amazing program. The registration process, you have to be very, very careful about. They're actually online. So Steve was very helpful in general. You know, I think his focus was also mostly on writing the grant. And we did a lot of iterations together. I had never written one of these grants. And, and they show you an example online in some of the institutes, but it's, it's not enough. So he was super helpful. I discovered later on in the process that some of these, the NIH institutes pay consulting companies to prepare kind of like YouTube videos explaining to you how to do the whole process. And I discovered them by the time I was submitting in the end, and it was super helpful. I don't think I could have submitted without it just because like there are hundreds of buttons that you, and sometimes I would ask Steve and he would tell me, but you have to be able to kind of have some sort of guide, which isn't unilaterally available. It's, it's very challenging. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It did get done. And I know that it was frustrating at times because you were getting emails from all of us. Hey, did you get your number yet? You registered It's just like, what's going on? How, what's how going hard should this be? <laughs> I'm like, I'm telling you, it's really hard. <laughs> So I guess words of wisdom is that for anybody else that wants to file, make sure that you read the instructions very closely, get experts to assist you. Yeah, there are these, these guides online in YouTube. I forget the name of the consulting companies that have done it, but the instructions also aren't good, right? So like the NIH, Steve was also always sending me to these things. Like the NIH has these guidelines where they explain to you how to do it, but the guidelines are 150 pages long, right? So you can like sit there and match it. So they have these really quick guides that these consulting firms have built that will show you in a 20 minute video how to submit your grant, right? And like, that's the only way to do it. Moving forward beyond that process, you've also had the ability to create some new partnerships in the United States. And one of them that we haven't talked a lot about was your partnership with J-Labs and the BARDA Blue Knight program, Seth. You want to talk a little bit about how you learned about it and what was the process to get engaged with them? Sure. So there are all sorts of rules about what you're allowed to say in public about the, about the J-Labs Blue Knight thing. So I'll just maybe I'll talk very briefly about how I came upon it and what it is. So BARDA and Johnson Johnson Innovation, which is also known as J-Labs, have a program called Blue Knight, which is really a government-initiated project to develop technologies for, you know, the Department of Defense, a lot of things having to do around, I wouldn't say directly about COVID, but, you know, in, in the general framework of, of COVID related things, but that spans out into other areas like of infectious disease, like flu or RSV. And they were interested in, in technologies that had to do with modulating the host immune response to all sorts of pathogens, which is largely dependent on neutrophils. So I, I again, as I mentioned, you have to be super aggressive about non-dilutive funding opportunities. And I'm always submitting any grant that I can find, you know, like I think you have to put the shots on goal more or less. And I saw this one in particular. And I think one of the things that I've learned from submitting so many of these grants is it has to be a really, really good fit between what they're looking for and the data that you have. Because again, there are hundreds of companies who are applying for these things. So it's not going to be that you're going to tell some story and they're going to choose you. You have to have the exact data that they want and it has to be good. So I felt in that particular situation that that was a good match. And we were very fortunate. You know, there was an interview process and they selected us. And it's a great opportunity for us. These are super critical for early stage companies. Anything that you can try and get, even if it's one out of 10, right? I think that that's more or less my batting average on these things. You know, it's worth it. Well, basically, it's a numbers game. But yet, as you're saying, the closer the needs are to what you can provide, the better chance you have with those numbers. But if you don't take the shots on goal, you're never going to win. So I did want to talk a little bit about J-Labs because Sally Elaine, who runs the Washington, D.C. J-Labs, is on the Biohealth Innovation Board. So it's an excellent program, provide great access to a lot of the company's resources. And it's really an introduction to one of the largest bio company in the world and all of the resources they may be able to bring to you. So congratulations on that win, because I know it's not easy. Let's sort of work into a close here. I'm not talking to Seth Selpeter, who's the co-founder of CEO and CEO of Immunex, Israeli and American based company. Talk a little bit about the balance that you have to have in managing a company that has operations in two countries. 
especially as an early stage startup and some of the good things about it, some of the challenges you have in managing an Israeli and American presence simultaneously, Seth. So I think I'm fortunate, again, because I am from New York City and we're based in New York City. So, you know, whenever I'm there, it's just like it's not being You're a home. weird place. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm home. Sometimes I think when I wake up in Israel, I'm like, you know, where am I? But that's where you are today. <laughs> yes. But, you know, the truth is the place where you grew up, you know, I spent the first 23 years of my life in New York City. I mean, you can never really leave that. So wherever that might be. So for me, I think it's not been as challenging as it might be for other people, because, you know, when I interact with people in the U.S., it's seamless because I'm American and I've been in Israel for long enough that, you know, I understand how to interact with people here. So I think that the main challenge, I think, when you're managing early stage startups, aside from all the the issues with the investors and, and whatever, is obviously managing people. So whether you have four people in your company or 10 people in your company, at the end of the day, your key challenge as the CEO is to manage people and to, you know, make sure that, you know, they're happy and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and and you're meeting deadlines. So I think that the main challenge I would probably say is, you know, you're managing people with two completely different sets of backgrounds and different expectations in different countries, right? And, you know, you have to know how to manage those people, right? So managing people is hard enough. Now you're managing people with two completely different sets of expectations in two completely different languages, right? With different holidays, everything. So I think that that's really the main challenge that people will probably face. I think that, you know, in my situation, obviously it's a little bit easier, you know, over time as Immunix is not the first multinational company. I think what usually ends up happening is the company grows to a certain threshold where you have somebody who's either the general manager of the US side or the general manager of the UK side or whatever it is. And then you have one person who knows how to manage the local team and you're basically just interacting with them. So obviously it's a challenging stage where the company can't afford something like that. But I think that, you know, I try and manage it as best as I can. And and I think, again, I have a unique advantage for that challenge. Yeah, well, congratulations on the balance right now. You seem to be doing well. You're still smiling sometime. At this moment. (laughs) Yeah, at this moment, yeah. There's no video on the podcast, right? No, 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 no. I can see your face, though, as we're talking. So I know that you're smiling. As we close, talk a little bit about your goals for the future and anything else you believe would be beneficial to the listeners that we haven't covered, Seth. Yeah, so I think our main goals for the future are obviously getting our drugs in the clinic and, you know, getting them to help people. I think that it's a very interesting and novel scientific endeavor, but at the end of the day, and obviously a business endeavor, people want to be successful, but but the goal is really to try and you know develop new modalities, new technologies and therapies that can be beneficial. And I think that's also been something that I've tried to, you know, really focus us in on as we started. I think one investor told me that it was a very East Coast way of thinking that I was trying to actually bring a drug to patients. So was that a good thing for him? I told him it was a good thing. I don't think it was a good thing for him, but to me, yeah. I took it as a compliment. If somebody tells me I'm being very East Coast, they've given me a big compliment. Okay. So, well, that means you're going to be faster anyway. That's true. I definitely talk pretty quickly. So that's really what we're focused on in developing. And I think the quicker we get molecules into the clinic, then the more that will allow us to scale up to new indications and new molecules and new technologies. I think... Yeah, I think that's about it from myself and Munich. Any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. No, I think we've covered the gamut, but the only question some of the listeners might have is if they want to learn more about Immunix, how can they come in contact with you? Sure. So you can send me an email, S-E-T-H at Immunix, I-M-M-U-N-Y-X.com. You know, all of our information is on our website, Immunix.com. I'm pretty available. So you can drop me an email, give me a call. Whatever it is, I, I between the different time zones, I'm, I'm working from early to late at night. So I love to talk to different people. And I think that that's super important as well. You know, always be meeting new people. As we said before, you know, 95, 99% of the time, it doesn't you know necessarily work out. But over time, you get the wins if you take enough shots. Well, thank you for taking a shot on goal with BHI. We're glad that we've had a chance to work with you. Want to continue to help support you as you continue to grow. And think you have significant potential and wish you the best of luck on your SBI proposal and all of the other relationships you're going to have. 
And I want to thank Seth Salpeter, who is the co-founder and CEO of Immunix for being on BioTalk today. Seth, thanks for being here. Great being here, Rich. Have a great day. You too. Have a good night. Thanks for listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis.